When Ruth first met Naomi, she was surrounded by a family filled with grief. <laughs> Some time ago, the family had been forced to leave Bethlehem and go to Moab because of a famine. And then, Naomi's husband, Elimelech, somehow died. <gasps> Naomi did not take it very well. <laughs> But years passed, and her sons Marlin and Killian both married Moabite women, Ruth and Orpah. But then the brothers died. Also under unknown circumstances. After this, the three women lived together in Moab, until one day, they were told that the famine in Judah was over. Given her present circumstances, Naomi supposed there was nothing better to do than return home. She began packing immediately. <sighs> it took them a moment to realize that there was no real reason Orpah and Ruth should join her. In fact, it was ill-advised. Under Jewish law, they'd be required to marry their dead husband's brothers. But since their dead husbands were one another's brothers, things could get rather complicated. Naomi encouraged Orpah and Ruth to remain in Moab, as there was no real future for them in Bethlehem. Orpah chose to stay in Moab. However, Ruth could not bring herself to desert Naomi and insisted that she stay by Naomi's side indefinitely. Where you go, I will go. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. Wow. <laughs> As a Moabite woman, the welcome that Ruth received in Bethlehem lacked a certain luster. Any joy in Naomi's homecoming was cut short by the realization that they were now two destitute widows with no way to support themselves. Ruth, realizing the gravity of their situation, <gasps> asked if she could glean the fields, which in those days was how many of the poor survived by following behind harvesting farmers and gathering leftover grain. These particular fields were owned by a man named Boaz. Boaz was a religious man, a rich man, a generous man, a smart man. Well, at least that's how he thought of himself. The Lord be with you! No matter what Ruth thought of him personally, he did offer her protection and safety. He took pity on this hard-working foreign girl. Ruth found his displays quite endearing, <laughs> if not a bit amusing. <laughs> Ruth told Naomi about her day. Naomi realised the man Ruth had worked for was Boaz, her kinsman. If perchance Ruth were to somehow marry Boaz, they would both be well cared for. So Naomi developed a scheme whereby Ruth, in the night, would sneak onto the threshing floor and lay at Boaz's feet. It was a dangerous plan. If Boaz was pleased to find her there, then all would be well. But he could just as well take offence to her advances and want nothing to do with her or even accuse her of adultery which was a capital offence. All risks aside, there was also the issue of Boaz himself. Boaz was not a young man. However, Ruth realised that whether or not Boaz was her first choice for a husband, 
He was clearly the best chance she had to support Naomi, and so she selflessly agreed to the plan. Ruth's first obstacle was to get past a man who referred to himself as the guard of the threshing floor. Before long, Boaz returned from a feast and fell asleep. This was the most dangerous part. If anyone else saw her there, they'd assume she was a prostitute, which would ruin her chances of marrying anyone, let alone Boaz. The plan was working flawlessly. Having succeeded, it was unclear to Ruth as to how exactly laying at Boaz's feet was going to lead to marriage. Ruth decided that whatever was going to happen, she might as well get on with it. Boaz couldn't tell who it was in the dark, but was glad to learn it was Ruth. As Ruth and Boaz spoke through the night, Ruth realised that Boaz, while a bit eccentric, was indeed a good man. I like you, Ruth. I like you too. There was one little matter, however. One kinsman stood ahead of Boaz in the line to inherit Ruth. Boaz pledged to deal with the matter. In order to make a smooth transition from there, exploits on the threshing room floor, Boaz had to convince his kinsman, who we'll call Nigel, to give up his inheritance of not only Ruth, but all of the land that Naomi's family owned in Judah. Boaz decided to utilise the classic bait-and-switch strategy, explaining that Naomi's land was indeed for sale to her nearest kinsman. But if Nigel bought the land, by law, he would also have to marry Ruth. It's a very complicated situation. Hmm. Uh -huh. Nigel agreed to let Boaz buy the land and gave him his sandal to confirm the transaction. Uh, whatever. And so Boaz and Ruth were free to marry. <laughs> and it wasn't long before they had a child named Obed. And Naomi had a grandchild which didn't bring her sons and husband back, but did make her feel a little less bitter. As for Ruth, she did as she promised. Where Naomi went, she went. Naomi's people were her people, and Naomi's God, her God. And where Naomi died, Ruth, sometime later, died. Somehow. And what of Obed, her son? Obed went on to have a son named Jesse, who was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, who was the father of Rehoboam, who was the father of Abijah. 23 equally unpronounceable generations later, Jacob was father to Joseph, whom you may better know as husband to Mary, mother of Jesus of Nazareth. And thus, in about 800 short years, Ruth went from Moabite outcast to Christian ancestor in the truest sense of the word. This is the story of King David. Yes, that David. <laughs> and that David. Uh, <clears throat> Our story begins with the prophet Samuel, who anointed Israel's first king, Saul. Don't remind me. In rather short order, King Saul began to ignore and even violate many of God's laws as if he believed himself to be mm. above the law. Ow! Only priests can offer sacrifices to the Lord, you twit! God said this old king business was a bad idea.
However, the people were determined. If Saul was not a good king, then a better one must be found. God sent Samuel to a prominent farmer named Jesse. Among Jesse's sons, Samuel would find the next king. Jesse had a lot of sons. Uh, anyone else? Jesse hadn't even considered including his youngest son, David, a humble shepherd. But... Okay, okay, I get it. Meanwhile, King Saul was becoming more and more erratic. Who says that I'm a bad king? I will cut you! I will cut you all! Saul demanded music be brought in to soothe him. His servants recommended the young David. David was an accomplished composer and soon found favor with the entire court. In addition to being a great musician, David would later make a name for himself on the battlefield, fighting against the Philistines. The women have even been singing. Saul has killed his thousands, but, but David has killed his ten thousands. <laughs> As David's popularity grew, Saul's ability to contain his jealousy rapidly diminished. When Saul discovered that his son Jonathan had befriended David, Saul had a sudden lapse in judgment. Dad! <laughs> David, you're great. No, no, no you're no. great. You're Though awesome. David was the embodiment of loyalty to the king, Saul was still determined to destroy David. I think you might be stressing out my old man. Maybe you should take a vacation. Mm -hmm. And so began David's travels in the countryside around Israel. Somehow, the Philistines found out that David was no longer a protector of Israel and mounted a massive attack. Saul was ready to defend his kingdom though his spirit had become bitter and broken. We must defend our kingdom at all costs! You can go first. <laughs> oh, would somebody just kill me? You! Me? Kill me! What? No! Uh-uh! <clears throat> Fine! Meanwhile, David had gathered a band of followers and become a champion of the oppressed, even earning the respect of some of his bitterest enemies. A man from Saul's camp arrived, bringing news of Saul's death. Despite the fact that Saul had repeatedly attempted to kill him, David was deeply saddened by this news. And I killed him. Now you can become king over all of Israel. Ah? Uh, ah? Uh. Hmm. It was apparent that this man was an opportunist and a liar. Ah. So instead of rewarding him, David ordered that he be killed for laying hands on God's anointed. <laughs> David was unshakably loyal to his king. Wait a second. What was that about being king over all Israel? David was indeed proclaimed king of all Israel. He was an extremely popular king, even with other kings. God was also excessively pleased with David and sent the prophet Nathan to further express this. The Lord is well pleased with you, for you have proven yourself a humble and loyal servant. Though David was typically quite modest about any sort of personal success, he had to admit, things were going exceptionally well for him. Until... Who is... who is that? 
Who's, who's it? What, what? David was informed that the woman's name was Bathsheba. 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 I just met a girl named Bathsheba. And suddenly I found how magical. Uh, <laughs> sorry. David was deeply moved by Bathsheba which was quite problematic due to the fact that she was already married to a soldier named Uriah. However, in a moment of weakness, David chose to overlook this detail. <clears throat> when it was discovered that Bathsheba was pregnant with his child, David attempted to cover his tracks by ordering her husband, Uriah, onto the front lines in the hopes that he would be killed. <laughs> Victory! And oh, boy. indeed he was. David subsequently married Bathsheba. The Lord sent Nathan to announce the consequences of David's grievous sin. Because of this great sin, the son born to you by Bathsheba will die, and calamity will be brought down upon your house. Make yourself right with the Lord. When Nathan departed, Bathsheba's infant son became gravely ill. David pleaded for the child's life, fasting for days and repenting in sackcloth and ashes. But on the seventh day, the child died. The Lord forgave David and Bathsheba and blessed them with another son, Solomon. And God continued to hold David in very high favor. Blessings on all the house of David, for the Lord has promised that your kingdom shall endure and the throne of David will be established forever. David, despite his flaws, was nevertheless a man after God's own heart. In the last days of King David's reign over Israel, the new kingdom held its breath. What would happen when David finally died? Who would be the next king? Seeing his father in such a weakened state, David's eldest son, Adonijah, decided it was at least in his best interest to take over the throne. The prophet Nathan gently reminded Adonijah that he would have to be chosen by God and anointed before he could call himself the king of Israel. Adonijah viewed this as petty details. He decided to take matters into his own hands and set about planning a hostile takeover. <coughs> to avoid what would otherwise be a rather messy transition with wars and such, Nathan thought it best that David's younger son, Solomon, be king. However, he also knew that only Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, could win David's blessing for him. The king, up to this point, had been blissfully unaware of the situation. David! <laughs> Hi, sweetie. Um... Bathsheba informed him that Adonijah had already declared himself king and was consolidating his power while David was still alive. Solomon, on the other hand, was still loyal to his father. As soon as he heard that Adonijah was already calling himself king... David called Solomon to his bedside. David warned his son that he would have to take harsh measures to assure the succession, and gave him his blessing to do so. True to his father's wishes, Solomon did some house cleaning after David passed, calling on one of his father's mighty men, Benaiah, to do the job. Long live Adonijah! 
And it wasn't just Adonijah. Solomon gave Benaiah an extensive to-do list. All of these purges and acts of vengeance wearied Solomon. Was this really all there was to being king? He certainly hoped not. Lord, you were deep in my father's heart. Help me to be a good king. God replied by offering to give Solomon anything he wanted. Anything? Dude, anything. Well, now I could use... No, I could really use him. Two for the... Monkey... Ah, Lord, give me wisdom so that I might lead your people in the place of my father. God was thoroughly pleased with Solomon's request and blessed him with unparalleled wisdom. Soon, Solomon became famous throughout the kingdom for his wisdom in words and action. Smugness of smugness, all is... No, 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 no. Self-regard, all is self... Not zingy. I need zing. Hmm. What is the plural no, for conceited? No, it's my no, it's baby. Mine. No, it's my baby. It's, it's, it's my baby. It's your it's baby. Mine. It's your baby. It's, it's my me. baby. Oh, if it's both yours, why don't you just cut it in half? <gasps> Sounds good to me. What? His fame spread outside the kingdom and across the known world, such that luminaries like the Queen of Sheba came to bask in his wisdom. Eros, era... Arrogance. All is arrogance? Oh! Well, hello. Though little is known about the details of her visit. My love is like the of the garden, the apples of her like the dough in her and the luscious grapes of her Under Solomon's wise rule, Israel found itself a land at peace. Because of this, the long overdue construction of the Lord's temple could finally begin. Something Solomon's father, David, had earnestly wanted to get around to, but found himself overrun with a variety of wars. Solomon summoned the celebrated bronze worker, King Hiram of Tyre. All I'm saying is, if you're building your guard a new home, you might as well build yourself a new palace while you're at it. Because your dad's old place, I mean, it's nice and all, if you like retro. Solomon couldn't resist the idea. So at the same time he was building a temple for the Lord, he also built a great palace for himself. Many years later, the prophet Nathan was greatly moved when he finally beheld what Solomon had built for the Lord. Oh. Oh, no, actually, this is my place. Temple's up the hill. Come on, I'll show you. <sighs> In truth, Solomon spared no expense for the house of God. It was a significant upgrade from the tent the Israelites had previously used to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Impressive, right? right? You done, done your father, father proud, Sully! Why are, Why are we, we shouting? I have no idea! The glory of the Lord filled the temple, and the people celebrated for 14 days. <laughs> you guys! Oh, you're too much! No! No, no you're right! I guess I am pretty awesome! <laughs> A few months later, Nathan paid a visit to Solomon's palace. Mm, Solomon's out back with his ride. Nathan was becoming more and more concerned for the king. His success seemed to be getting to his head. All his, uh, his egotism? Yeah. Nate! Hey, how you doing? Impressive, right? This ain't good, Sully. 
You think these ladies are beautiful? Wait till you meet my 700 wives. Meow. Who wants to worship some idols? Solomon had turned away from God, which does seem quite unwise, being that it was God that had blessed him with all that he had. All his pride? No. All is voluptuous, no? Perhaps it was his abundance of everything that had blinded him. God was quite upset at Solomon and told him that because of his unfaithfulness, Solomon's kingdom would be divided after his death. In the end, it seemed that the only person who did not listen to Solomon's wisdom was Solomon himself. Years later, Solomon passed his doomed kingdom to his son, Rehoboam. You'll need the... Oh! That! You'll need that! Vanity! <laughs> That's it! Vanity of vanities! All his... <clears throat> All his what?